guess that's my cue to start, <laughs> right? Good. Okay, so good morning and welcome. Uh, it is lovely to be back here in Sofia again, uh, especially with the weather so nice outside. What I'm going to talk about this morning is how you can migrate your applications to JDK 9 or JDK 10, because when we look at the changes that are taking place, the more rapid changes that are taking place in terms of the JDK, it's important to understand what might be an issue from the point of view of backwards compatibility. In the past, Java has been very good at not breaking things, but JDK 9 is a bit different, and it's a bit different in a couple of ways, which we'll obviously talk about. Since JDK 10 is just an evolution of JDK 9, we can talk about both of them together, because I saw that a couple of people are using JDK 9. The likelihood is most people are probably going to move in terms of the next release to JDK 11, because it's a long-term support release. So the first thing is to look at JDK 9. And I borrowed this slide from Oracle. I used to work for them, so I feel it's fair that I can borrow some of their slides. And this is a complete list of everything that went into JDK 9. And if you count all those things up, I don't expect you to be able to read them. If you count them all up, there's 85 new features in JDK 9. Of those, many of them are really quite small, and many of them are at the sort of JVM level. So they're the kinds of things that aren't typically going to affect most developers. There are two big things, though, that we need to understand about JDK 9. The first is that the way the JDK is being developed and the changes that are being made is different in JDK 9. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the history of Java, right from JDK 1.0, we have added more and more features, more and more APIs to the JDK. That's a, a really good thing, because it becomes a, a richer platform, it's easier to do things, it's more powerful. But what we have not done until JDK 9 is remove anything. So we've gradually added more and more things, and a lot of those things, or not a lot, but some of those things are now sort of very dated. And those things were very hot topics back in the late 1990s, but very few people use them now. And so it makes a lot of sense to start cleaning up the JDK. That's what's happened in JDK 9. It's what's continuing in JDK 10 and also in JDK 11. And as I say, we'll explain some more about that as we go through. Now, when it comes to migrating applications, Oracle have given us some guidance. This is a quote from Oracle's product management. And they say, clean applications that just depend on Java SE should just work. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not quite as reassuring as I would like. Personally, I would like to see clean applications that just depend on Java SE will just work, not should. There's, a, there's an element of doubt there. And that's a good, good thing in terms of what they've said. So we need to understand what is actually changing. Now, the biggest thing in JDK 9, from the point of view of how the JDK is moving forward, is the Java platform module system. This was the big thing which took some time to, to actually get completed. There were some delays in terms of JDK 9, but they wanted to make sure that this was, was right and tried to make sure it affected as few applications, as few libraries and frameworks as possible. So let's spend just a little bit of time talking about what the platform module system is and therefore how it might affect the applications that you have. Well, the first thing is as I said, if you, if you go right back in history to JDK 1.0, and you look at the class files, the standard libraries that you got there, there were about 200 classes in JDK 1.0. That was a, a nice sort of small set of libraries. It gave you things like strings. It gave you things like integer and so on. But we needed more. And so over time, 
more and more APIs have been added to the standard Java class libraries. If you look at JDK 8, there's about 4,500 classes in RT.jar, standard libraries. Again, that's really good because it means that as developers, we don't have to create our own list interface. There's already one there. There's an array list as an implementation of that. There's a semaphore class, so we don't have to write that. There's a SQL statement class. All of these things are there. We don't have to write them ourselves. It's wonderful to have this rich toolkit that we have available. But the problem is that by keeping it all in one monolithic rt.jar, it's become very unmanageable. We're seeing the way that applications are developed moving to the idea of microservices. We want to have only the code that we need for a specific service deployed in a container. Very logical. And having all these libraries in our Java runtime doesn't really fit so well with that idea. The module system, in its sort of fundamental idea, is to take this big rt.jar and break it up into modules. So we have a more manageable set of parts of the library. And that way, when we're creating our microservices and we need to build a runtime deployment, we can say, let's just take the modules we need for our specific application. We don't have to include everything, just the ones we need. That's better from the point of view of performance. There's issues around the way that the class path gets scanned. It's better in terms of security because there's less of an attack surface. It's better for the JDK developers in terms of maintainability. And it also shrinks the size of the runtime you need for your deployment. So all of this is very good. Now, if you look at the, the way that this has got broken up, there are 97 modules now in the JDK. And of those, there are 28, which are the Java SE standard. That's the one that's defined through the JCP. It's the one that is the JSR. And that defines all the, the, the libraries that you have to have to conform to Java as a standard. There's also a whole range of other ones. There's, I think there's eight for JavaFX. There's a couple that are Oracle specific. And then there's quite a large number, which are JDK ones. And they cover all sorts of things. They cover things like the JLink command. They cover things like um, the JDepra scan command, all sorts of things like that. And then there's also one which is called unsupported. And kind of mention that again in a moment. So the idea is that it simplifies how you can actually build the runtime so you just have the modules you need. Now, the other thing that the Oracle developers wanted to do was to encapsulate internal APIs. Again, if you look at rt.jar, there's 4,500 public classes. But there's also a number of classes in that jar file which are non-public. They're the internal APIs, the ones that are put there to make the public ones work. So that's all very good. And right from the very beginning, Sun and Oracle have been very explicit about this. They've said, do not use these APIs. Not recommended because they're not guaranteed to be available in future releases. They're not documented. They're not intended for public use. Now, the most famous of those is Sun Misc Unsafe. So anybody here used Sun Misc Unsafe? Couple of people. OK. Anybody used a third-party library or a framework in you know, Spring, something like that? Yes. So you have all used Sun Misc Unsafe. You just don't know it. And as I say, the idea was to encapsulate those. So you would no longer be able to access those internal APIs. Now, because so many frameworks, so many libraries, and so many people have used things like Unsafe, the decision was made that that wasn't going to be possible in JDK 9. It just was going to break too many things. So there are ways that you can gain access to the internal APIs, and I'll explain some of the, uh, the switches that you can use in a moment. So the whole idea is modules moving away from the class path to using the module path. 
how do you migrate applications from JDK 8 or earlier to JDK 9? Well, you can sort of do it in three steps. The first is to simply ignore modularity completely. At the moment, you have an application where you have a set of jar files. You put those jar files on the class path, and then you can run your application. The same thing will work with JDK 9. So you can ignore the module path, leave all your jar files on the class path, make no changes, and your application should just work, remembering what the Oracle product management people said. So what happens if you leave everything on the class path is all the jar files, all of the packages in there, become part of the unnamed module. So it fits in with the module system because everything on the class path becomes one module and works with the other modules which are defined on the module path. From the point of view of how that works, all the packages you have in your jar files are exported and made available to everything on the module path. And everything on the module path is assumed to be a dependency for the unnamed module. So as I say, this means that from the simplistic point of view, it should just work. What you can then do is you can gradually migrate to the use of modules. So you can take your jar files and not make any changes to them, leave them exactly the same as they are, but move them from the class path to the module path. That way, rather than being part of the unnamed module, they become an automatic module. An automatic module is one where it doesn't have any specific module information, and so its name will be the same as the name of the jar file. And again, it will make all of its packages available to everything else on the module path, and the assumption will be that it depends on everything else on the module path. So again, it makes it easy to move to the module system. The third step is if you really want to convert to using modules in your application. At that point, you can say, right, when I want to build my jar file again, I will include a module info.java file, which gets compiled into a module info.class file. That will allow you to specify things like the explicit name of the module. It also allows you to say that you have dependencies on certain other modules and that you only want certain packages to be exported. You can keep other packages internal to your jar file. So again, that gives you a migration path so that everything will gradually move from not using the module path to using the module path completely. Now, I said about encapsulation. There is this command line flag that the developers added shortly before JDK 9 was launched. And it's the, the wonderfully named Big Kill Switch and has the, the flag illegal access. I think this is a great sort of name for this. And illegal access has four different parameters that you can specify with it. The first, which is the default as of JDK 9, still in JDK 10, is permit. What that says is that you are allowed to use the internal APIs of the JDK classes, but when you do use one of them, you'll get a warning message the first time that you actually use one of these APIs. If you need to get more information, you can change that to the second option, which is to give you warnings. That way, every time you use one of the internal APIs, you'll get a warning message. So you'll be able to see how many times you've used it in a particular application. And then if you need even more information, you can go up to the next level and you can say, debug. What that will do is it will give you a warning message every time you use an API that's internal, but it will also give you a stack trace so that you can see how did I get to using that API from inside of my code. You can use that trace back and figure out how to change your code to avoid using that internal API. And then the last option that's available is deny. And that's what the developers intend to make the default at some point in the future. When that will happen is not clear. It didn't happen in JDK 9, didn't happen in JDK 10. I don't believe it's going to happen in JDK 11. Let's see when it actually gets turned on so that we stop getting access to internal APIs. 
I think one of the things that's probably quite likely is that when they have replacements for all of these internal APIs that are public, then they'll be able to turn it off. There are some other ways that you can reverse encapsulation. If you don't want to just turn off everything and make all of the internal APIs available to all of your code, you can do it in a more precise way. What you can do is you can say, if you want to import certain APIs, then you can use the add exports flag. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. As we can see here, we could say, OK, we want to add the ability to access APIs within the Java management module. And we want to make the com.sun.jmx.remote.internal package available to only my test module. So you can limit who has access to that. If you want to make it generally available, then again, you can say Java management module, Sun management package is going to be available to all the classes that are on the class path. So everything in the unnamed module. The other way of accessing these APIs that's quite typically used is through reflection. And again, there's a flag that's available so that you can set that up if you want to have reflective access to specific internal APIs. And you do that through the add opens flag. And again, simple example where with the Java base module, we want to have reflective access to the Java util package. And so we can say, OK, add opens to that package, and all the unnamed modules will be able to access it in that way. If you don't want to change the command line flags, then you can do it through the jar manifest. So you can avoid the problems of saying, OK, I'm going to ship a jar file which contains my library. I don't want to force developers to have to change the command line flags. So I'll add something in terms of the manifest so that I can say, in this case, we want to be able to add for importing the Java base Sun security provider package. And that makes life a little bit easier if you're developing a library that you want to make available to other developers. The obvious thing that you would need is also the ability to find out where the internal APIs are being used by your code. So there is a nice command called jdeps. And jdeps will analyze the dependencies that your code has on things in the JDK. And there's a variety of command line flags you can set to get different information. So I thought, OK, let's try this out and find a jar file that could be interesting to look at. So I thought, Minecraft. Minecraft's a good Java application. And I ran JDEPS on the version of Minecraft 1.8, so a rather old one. And I said, list me the dependencies. And I got Java base, Java data transfer, Java desktop, Java management, Java naming. OK, all good information. And then you get this line, not found. And you think, what was not found? It's a rather confusing message at that point. But I did a little bit of digging into this. And it turns out that what you really need to do is you need to set the class path. So if you just run it on one jar file, there'll be a whole bunch of things that it can't get resolved. So you need the class path to include all the other things that you would have um, on the Minecraft um, command line that starts up the application. But I do think that's a little bit of a, um, a poor error message, just saying not found. It should be you know, class path not found or something like that, which gives you more information. Next thing we need to understand is, in terms of JDK 9, that there are some missing modules. Again, remember what I said in terms of the quote from product management, which is clean applications that only use Java SE. Now, that's a very precise way of putting things. Java.se is one of the modules in the JDK. And in fact, it's what's called a meta module. A meta module is one that doesn't include any packages itself, but just includes references to other modules. Java.se is all 28 of the modules which make up the Java standard. There is another meta module in the JDK, which is java.se.ee. And the decision has been made in JDK 9 that this will not be included by default. If you try and compile an application that uses anything from the modules in the Java SE EE module, 
then it will not compile. You get a compiler error because it can't resolve the classes you need. If you try and take a JDK 8 application that was compiled, and you try and run that on JDK 9, if it uses any of the classes in those modules, it will not start, because the JVM will not be able to resolve the classes it needs. So that's both comp compilation and runtime. Which things are affected? Well, there are six modules that are included in here. The first of those is Corba, and I'm fairly certain there's not many people using Corba. So that's probably not too much of a, a problem. Java.transaction is also a small module that's related to Corba, so nothing too much to worry about there. Java activation is to do with the Java Beans framework. So if you are using Java Beans, then you may have to look at what you're using in terms of the APIs. And then there are some APIs which are related to web services or XML. XML bind is the JAXB. Java XML binding API. And then Java XML web services and web service annotation is the old, um, or say old, older SOAP based way of doing web services. Most people use RESTful web services now. The SOAP based WSDL approach is encapsulated in the modules XML.ws and WS.annotation. So these are the kind of things that you need to be thinking about. If you're using web services based on SOAP, your code on JDK 9 will not run straight away. You'll need to make some changes. And in fact, the way to do that in JDK 9 is that you can actually add the modules that you need into the runtime. So you can say add modules, java.corba. Solves the problem very quickly in JDK 9. There are also some standalone versions, except for Corba, available through Maven. There's relevant reference implementations for each of the JSRs. So again, you can solve the problem that way. And you can even have your own version, which you put onto the, uh, the module path. And you can do it through the upgrade module path parameter to the command line. So there are different ways of, of solving this problem. In JDK 9, it's not really too much of an issue. Small incompatibilities for JDK 9. What are the kind of things that might catch you out? Well, the first of those is that in JDK 9, a single underscore is now a keyword in Java. So hands up anybody who's used a single underscore as a variable name. OK. okay. Well, you're not going to be able to do that in JDK 9. Because if you try to do that, you'll get this error message, which is, as of release 9, JDK uh, underscore is a keyword and may not be used as an identifier. Now, I did look at this, and I did some research, and I found that it's OK. If you want to use a single underscore, you can actually change it to two or more underscores, and it will still work quite happily. So if, you, if you're really you know, determined to use this rather obscure way of having a variable name, then you can still do it with two or more. As I said, JDK 9 has started a cleanup of the, the Java platform. Certain things which have been deprecated in the past are now starting to be removed. And in fact, in JDK 9, there are six methods that have been removed. In the jar pack 200, jar pack unpack 200, and the logging log manager classes, each of those has two methods add and remove property change listener that have been removed. Now, you have to look at that and you go to think to yourself, OK, they removed six methods, add and remove property change listener. What did these methods do that was so bad that meant they were the first ones to get removed? And the reality is that it's to do with some of the obscure connections that they found between different code when they were separating things up into modules. And if you, if you didn't do things like this, you ended up with a situation where basically every module depended on every other module. So you couldn't make nice distinctions and then only ship the modules you needed for your application. 
one of the classes in JDK9 was removed. So this is a deprecated class. It's the com, uh, com .sun .security .auth .callback dialog callback handler. And I'm fairly sure there's quite a few, not many people who actually use this. I did find one person in an audience when I was talking about this who had actually used it. It's part of the Java authentication and authorization service. It was already deprecated back in JDK 7. So if you've been compiling your code and you actually used this, you would have been getting a warning message. Another thing that's useful is the ability to find deprecated APIs that you used in your code. And if you look, you'll find there's this thing called jdeprescan, which is new in JDK 9. And it will take a class file, it will take a, a jar file, and it will do a static analysis on it to look at all the elements that you've used in that code and see if any of them are deprecated. So I did a, a simple example where I, I wrote um, a class which had a few deprecated elements in it. And you can see here that it comes up and tells you that there's a, a type that's been deprecated. So that's a class. There's a method that's been deprecated. Um, and what else have we got? Yes, yeah, some, some other methods as well. But it gives you a list of things that you've used which you might need to go and look at in terms of moving to newer versions of the, the platform. Some more obscure things, I would say. So the, the structure of the JDK and the JRE has, has changed. If you look at JDK 8 and earlier, you will see that the JDK directory structure is like this. So you've got JDK itself, then you've got a bin directory that contains Java C and Java and Java H and things like that. Then you've got a lib directory that contains the tools.jar file. And then you've got this separate JRE directory. And in the JRE directory, you've got a bin directory that contains the Java executable. So you actually get two Java executables for the price of one. And then a lib directory which contains rt.jar. That's all been changed in JDK 9. And now we've got a flat directory structure with one bin directory, one copy of Java, Java C, Java H, and so on. There's a conf directory that contains the files that you might potentially need to change to configure your JDK. It's, again, some, some fairly obscure things like sound configuration, some font stuff. There's a lib directory for native code, and then there's a jmods directory, which contains all the modules, which used to be rt.jar. So there's no more JRE directory, there's no more tools.jar, there's no more rt.jar. The reason I'm telling you this is because if you have an application that relies on certain files being in certain places in the JDK, then you would have to need to make some changes to move to JDK 9. Similarly, the version string format. If you rely on the version string format for the JDK, if you're looking for certain things so that you can determine if you've got the right version of the JDK for your application, you might need to make some changes. The problem is that if you look at the version string format, historically, there have been pretty much as many version string formats as we've had versions of Java. Um, I like to sort of go through this because it's, it's kind of entertaining. So we started off with JDK 1.0, very logical. Then the next release was JDK 1.1. Well, that was already a mistake because it really should have been JDK 2.0 because there were a lot of quite big changes. Then we got JDK, or no, actually we got Java SE 2 version 1.2, which kind of immediately got more complicated. And that was because marketing got involved and, and engineering and, and they didn't agree. So then we had Java SE 2 version 1.3, 1.4, 1.4.1, 1.4.2. Then we got Java SE 2 version 5. And they decided to drop the one dot. So then we got version 5. Then we got Java SE 6, because they decided there was never going to be a Java 3, so let's drop the 2. Then we got Java SE 7, Java SE 8, Java SE 9. However, if you look at Java SE 8, for example, and you download Java SE 8 update 131, and you do Java minus version, what you actually get is 1.8.0 underscore 131 which is not very logical, and it, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So, uh, also, the way that things have been organized in the past, you know, you've got 7 update 55, 7 update 60, and you say, well, which one has more patches? 
Okay, logically, update 60 has more patches than update 55. No, you're wrong. Update 55 has more patches than update 60. So we now have the new, 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 improved Java version string format. Feature is the first number. And that's going to be the big number. So it's 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on. Then we have another number called interim. Interim is always going to be 0. <sighs> Okay, if it's always going to be zero, why do we have to have it? Fair enough, they do say that that is reserved for future expansion, so at least they're building some future-proofness into this. Then we have update, which again, logical, so we have 10.0.1, 10.0. Actually, no, yes, we do have 10.0.2. This was again something that got confusing with JDK 9, because you ended up with JDK 9, JDK 9.0.1, and then, what would you think the next update would be? Well, when I count, it would be 9.0.2. No, 9.0.4 was the second update to JDK 9. And that was because they needed to leave a gap between them, so if they needed to have an emergency patch, they still had room. Anyway, they now have a fourth number called patch, so we actually can put an emergency patch in if we need. Hopefully, this is the last time they're going to change the version string format for a long time, ever, maybe. A few things that are non-programmatic that might catch you out. If you're using Java Web Start, then you're using the Java Network Launch Protocol, the JNLP, and you can set up a configuration file with that. In JDK 9, they have now switched to using strict parsing of the configuration files. And that means that some configuration files that would have parsed in JDK 8 and earlier will no longer parse in JDK 9. So again, you just need to be aware of that and do some testing. Because of the module system, some of the things that we have had in the past have disappeared as well. The extension mechanism and the endorsed standards override mechanism typically are ways um, often used by things like application server vendors, where they want to load a set of class files before they start running your application, which they're going to use for the application server itself. But there's one thing here, which is if you've got some JNI code, for example, and you use the Java Home lib ext directory, and I know I've used this in the past myself, then that doesn't exist anymore in JDK 9. If you create it and you try and put a file in there, it will stop your JVM from running. So you need to be careful about that because you'll get an error message saying um, that you need to use the class path instead. Command line options. Um, a lot of command line options in JDK 8 were deprecated so that they could be removed in JDK 9. Most of these relate to garbage collection. And so there's a number of combinations of jar garbage collector that are no longer supported in JDK 9, so you can't use them uh, on the command line. There's things like the incremental concurrent mark sweep. That's completely gone away. There's some concurrent mark sweep foreground usage. And then there's a couple of sort of odd combinations, like if you were using the parallel new collector with the serial old collector. No idea where you do that, but um, you can't do that anymore. So just be aware that those things are not going to work. Logging. Again, this is, this is something which changed in JDK 9 and has a small impact from the point of view of compatibility. Rather than having different logging frameworks for all the different parts of the JVM, they switched to a unified JVM logging framework. Good idea. And obviously, one of those is logging of the garbage collection. The impact that this has is around the command line flags that you get on the JVM. So there's a lot of JVM flags that have been removed in JDK 9. So I, I won't bother listing all these out, but you can look at the slides afterwards. And essentially, if you've used any of these flags in your application and you leave them on the command line when you move to JDK 9, then your application will still run. But you'll get a warning message saying that the particular option has been removed and it no longer uh, is going to be used. So it's, it's, it's not too bad, but you have to change your command line. There are a lot of flags which have changed. So these are the ones that you might 
be more interested in, because a lot of people like to look at garbage collection, logging, um, tracing things, and so on. So if you've used any of these older JDK 8 options, then you need to change it to use the JDK 9 version because of the change to the unified logging system. So rather than doing print GC, which is a very common one, we now have to do minus X log colon GC. And if you want pre-GC details, it's minus X log colon GC start. And again, you can have a look at these afterwards, and there's a whole set of these that kind of map. Then there are even more command line flags that have been deprecated and will generate issues. So you get two different types of warnings with some of these. So one is saying print GC is deprecated, we will use the right one. So it's, it's nice and easy, it just tells you it's going to change the flag so it uses the correct one. And then there's you know, an option, create, create mini dump on crash, it was deprecated in version 9, likely removed in future release, use this one instead. So you get a warning message, good. Then, there are all these, and again, I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but these, there's 50 of them, so lots of the, the CMS incremental stuff, um, the print GC statistics and so on, and then a second page of them, which, again, I won't go through all of them, some tracing and stuff and more printing things. If you try and use any of these, and there are 50 of them, it will stop your JVM from starting. And that's quite significant, because it isn't like they're just ignored, it isn't that they get a warning message. This will actually prevent your application from starting. So what you'll see is unrecognized VM option, could not create the Java virtual machine, fatal exception has occurred, program will exit. Hmm. So these are the kind of things that you need to be careful of, because if you try and run your application, remember it should just work, but if you've used one of these, it won't. Okay, let's look at JDK 10. What are the changes that have happened in JDK 10 that will affect backwards compatibility? First of these is local variable type inference. We now have var in Java. So rather than having to specify the type of a variable and then assign an instance of a new object of that type to it, you can simply say var list equals new array list of type string, and the compiler will infer that the variable type is an array list of type string. The good news is that var was not made a keyword in Java. It is, however, a reserved type. What does that mean? Well, it means that this is still quite valid. You can do var var equals new array list of type string. Now, I put a tick next to that so that you could do it. I'm not recommending that. Probably isn't a good idea to call your variable var, but anyway, you can do that. What you can't do, which you could have done in JDK 9 or earlier, is create a class called var. Now, I'm sure nobody has actually done that, because remember, it should have been, a, um, you know, if you use the convention for Java, then an uppercase v should have been used for var. So yes, if you try and create a class called lowercase v var, then it will not compile in JDK 10. Once again, if you really want to do that, just change it to an uppercase v, and you are all good. It will solve one of your problems. Things that have been deprecated in the past and have been removed in JDK 10. So the JDK security auth module, there's um, in the com.sun.security.auth package, there's a number of um, APIs that have been removed. So policy file, Solaris numeric group principle, Solaris numeric user principle, and X500 principle. These are quite sort of odd ones, and as you can see, it's mostly related to Solaris. There are alternatives that you can use instead in the same package, so it's fairly easy to, to change to using those. And again, in the auth module package, there's two Solaris-related um, classes which have been removed as well. So if you're using Solaris and you've used any of these things, then you might have to look at your code and make sure it works using different APIs. The Java Lang Security Manager has a number of fields and things that have been removed. So the incheck field has been removed, and then there's these methods, class depth, class loader depth, current class loader, current loaded class, and so on, that have been removed. Again, if your code uses these, then you need to be aware of it, and you need to change your code to make it work on JDK 10. 
A couple of other things, there's a couple of very obscure internationalization methods which have been removed from the Java Lang runtime class. So get localized input stream and get localized output stream. Um, certainly I've never used these. Um, I suspect there's very few people who have. A couple of miscellaneous things, the Java H tool, which is part of the JNI set of functionality, that has been removed. Now you can do the same thing, but you need to do Java C minus H to generate the header file that you need for JNI. Again, if you've got scripts or something that's using Java H, you'll need to change it to use the new way of doing things. Also, the policy tool has been removed. So a simple thing on that point. Command line flags. So I talked about stuff that had changed in JDK 9 just now. And this is the kind of thing I like to do. I like to go through the source code, and I like to analyze just how many things have changed. So JDK 9 had 869 minus XX command line flags. 869, that's like a lot. And all sorts of weird and wonderful things that you can do. JDK 10 only has, I say only, only has 511. So they introduced four new flags, and they removed 362 command line flags. And I thought, wow, that's really impressive. What did they remove? And so I went through the whole list of 362 things that I found, and there's quite a few that were related to the G1 garbage collector. There's a number that are related to the way the JIT compiler works. And then there's a whole set of like obscure ones that I looked at, and I thought, I've never used any of them. So 362 flags, I've never used any of them. So it's probably not going to be too much of a problem. There was one that I found which I rather liked, though, and I, I tweeted about this last night, which is the minus XX force unreachable. And I thought to myself, ah, order on. <laughs> Star Wars. Anyway. Uh, a few other things that they've um, removed, the minus D32 and the minus D64 options, which are ones which allow you to switch between a 32-bit and a 64-bit virtual machine. Those have gone away. And then there are five of the minus X options. And I, I looked these up, and some of them are so obscure, I couldn't even find out what they did. So like, for example, minus X SQ no pause, I have no idea what it does. Right. So. Basically, to conclude then, what are we talking about here? So migrating from JDK to JDK 9 or JDK 10. If you want to, to move your application, then if you have a simple application, the chances are you'll be able to take it from JDK 8 or earlier and just drop it into the new JDK, and everything will run without any problems. Leave everything on the class path to start with, and your application should just run. There are clearly some issues around things like the command line flags. Um, if you're using the Java SE.EE module APIs, and if you're using any of the deprecated APIs that have actually been removed. But chances are most simple applications will just run. More complex applications, if you've used things like the internal APIs, if you're using third-party frameworks and libraries and so on, then there may be some work that you need to do. Key thing really is about testing. Um, encapsulation, as I said, you may want to use different command line flags to be able to set up the way that you get access to the internal APIs um, and various things like that. So there are a number of things that you need to look at, but on the whole, I, it's a little bit of work, but not too much. A few useful links. Again, I'll put the slides on SlideShare so you can get this. Um, Docs.oracle.com, Java SE Migrate. Um, and I've written a couple of blogs specifically about this. So there's uh, one on JDK 9 pitfalls for the unwary, JDK 9 extra command line options, and I'm in the process of writing a JDK 10 pitfalls for the unwary, which I've almost finished, which hopefully I'll be posting later this week. One other thing I'm just going to mention before I finish is Zulu Java, which is what we at Azul do. We basically take our uh, the open JDK source code, and we can build that into a binary distribution. We run the TCK on it, and we guarantee that it passes all of the tests, so it is a drop-in replacement for other Java versions. We have support for JDK 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, 
and we have wide platform support, including 32-bit Windows, 32-bit Linux, ARM32, 64-bit PowerPC. It is free. You can go to our website, you can download it for free, and you can use it under the GPL2 v2 with Class Park Exception license, and everything will work quite happily. If you're interested in support, commercial support, we will talk to you about a very reasonable price that we can do that for. And with that, thank you very much.